views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Hi, welcome. This is Dr. John Martini. This is one of the most amazing and inspiring shows that you can listen into. If you want to be on the edge of your seats, if you want to open up your heart, if you want to expand your mind, and you want to meet incredible people, stay tuned because you're just about to experience a transformative radio show that will change your life. And you're listening to the Dr. Pat Show that's coming up right next. The following audio is via a Skype call. Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Powerful, inspiring, and coming to you live, bringing you stories of people like you and me, busting through and living life full out. Get ready to dare to wonder what your life would be like if you knew you could not fail. Oh my gosh, everyone. Welcome. I want to welcome you to the Dr. Pat Show. I want to welcome you to Transformation Talk Radio. I want to welcome all of you, all of you to wherever you're listening, however you're listening. It's so great to be connecting with all of you. I want to give a shout out to Mr. Benny. Hey, Mr. B. What up, Dr. P? Hey, how you doing? Good. I be real good. <laughs> we're having it. We're going to we have a great show mm-hmm. lined up right here. The great show. Uh, and, you know, it's so funny when I I look at uh, some of the really cool conversations we're having, and some days I just look at some of the folks that that we get to talk with, and I'm just like, oh, I get this. I so get this. And, you know, today, my very special guest joining me, me here, Chef Rossi, I'm telling you, you know, New York City's wildest and most beloved anti-caterer. I love that. And so today, I'm so thrilled to be introducing all of you, not only to what Chef Rossi is all about, you know, but what is it that, what is it that is going on with this? What is it that's going on with this that people are loving? What are folks really tired of right now when we're thinking about food? You know, so here we go. She is the most amazing person at coming to the to the forefront and saying wait a minute wait a minute there's another way to look at this there's another way to look at what we're doing with food and it is amazing she's the owner and executive chef of the raging skillet a cutting edge catering company known for breaking any and all the rules thank you Thank you for that. She's earned a reputation as the one to call when it's time to do something different. And see, this is what we're what we're sensing now. You know, we're really sensing that the old way of doing things, the way to come about things is even even food. It's just like not what people are looking for now. All of a sudden, we're popping into the to the world where folks are expecting us to be different. They're expecting us to show a little bit of our wild side as well. You know, so That's today right. we get to talk with her about her book, her life, her love, and guess what? Her passion. Chef Rossi, it's great to have you here. Welcome oh, to the I'm wild so side. Happy. I'm so happy to be here. Boy, you have got so much energy. I need to spend more time with where you are. It's like you've got it going on, Mama. I'm going to come out to see you because I love that. Can we just talk first about, let's set the stage for this. Let's mm-hmm. talk about the wild side for a minute. And let's talk about what it means to break some of the rules, especially in the industry that you and I are in. I am so not, I, I, what did you say, anti-cater? I am the anti-radio host in that I, I don't really it. do radio that way. But what is it about you that all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, I'm not going to do things that way? Well, when I first got into catering, this was the 80s, and food all looked like linoleum. You know, it was very <laughs> pretty to look at, but it tasted like, forget it, it tasted like acid. And <laughs> you would have events and people would be like, well, it looks good and that's all that matters as long as it's not terrible. But Lord knows it won't be memorable. And we'll put all our money into the flowers and the china and whatnot. And I said, no. Why can't the food be fantastic? Why can't it be overflowing? Why can't it be marinated and we have sauces and just all the things that you would expect when you go out to eat? Why can't we have that at an event? So 
I kept catering weddings, and people would walk away saying, oh, my God, we actually had good food at a wedding. And I guess that's how I got started with the word of mouth thing. Yeah. I, I mean, is it? And, and it's so yours to do. This is a sense that I get for this. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. each of us, you know, people people ask me all the time, you know, wh- how did it how did it become you that was going to do this? How did it become you that, you know, positive talk, uplifting talk, solution based talk? And I said, honestly, I don't really have a clue, but I just know it, it is. It, did you have it that sense? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I didn't really have a choice. You know, I couldn't yeah. do horrible food. And I couldn't do what other other caterers were doing. And Lord knows I couldn't pay attention to the rules and the regulations. I was breaking them all left and right. So I figured I might as well just be me. And if people love it, then woohoo. And if they don't, go away. That's kind of how I've been ever since. Right. But, you know, it's the different aspect of this that people people really look at. You know, they look at, you know, this is your book. This is your this is really your message. And, you know. You have literally redefined the word different because a lot of times, Chef Rossi, right, when we say, oh, we're different, a lot of people go, okay, they're different. That means they're also less than. But isn't it true that being different really opens up the doors for greater possibilities about serving better? Absolutely. I mean, if anything, I probably have the highest food costs I've ever had in my life. The more we're trying to, like, show it off and do it and bring it to the max, you know, the more it's like fresh herbs, not dry herbs. I mean, everything's like more expensive than ever before. But the food feels great, feels great cooking it, feels great serving it, and people get into a great mood. You know, I'm kind of convinced that you really can taste when there's love in your food. Yes. You know, you could be on the highway somewhere and eat something and just be like, oh, this is highway food, blah. But you could also be on the highway somewhere and eat something and be like, someone's mama is in the kitchen. You know, and it's not like you could be taught that. It just has to be that passion coming through. I love this. I talked about my grandmother the other day, and I was so excited that, you know, my friend Gail Tour and Linda and everybody connected. And I was going to talk with you because I noticed that, you know, in your book, you says you, you start out by saying it is to my mother, uh, Harriet Ruby uh, Ross. And I thought to myself, you know, as I'm writing my book, who would I dedicate it to? And my grandmother popped up. Because here people come from the old country. They come in here. They move to the Bronx. And they bring the, the old country with them, herbs and food. And uh, my gosh, I mean, this is really part of it. But I want to ask you about one thing. What's that? Chutzpah. 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 Chutzpah yeah. is like you really can't decide, I'm, exactly. I'm just going to have chutzpah today. You That's know, right. You either have it or you don't. I mean, granted, you could be pushed over the edge of a cliff and just before you're falling suddenly be like, I've got chutzpah, you know, and bounce back <laughs> on, on the dry side, you know, but uh, I think I always did, you know, I was born a big fat baby, you know, my poor mother, I I was over 10 pounds, and I was was born hungry with my mouth flapping that I wanted to eat immediately, and I was like a year and a half old and took over my sister, who was a year and a half older, and my brother, who was like just born, I decided I was in charge, and I was just marching around being in charge, and I don't know, I've just sort of been that way ever since kind of a survival mode too you know yeah i i was brought up in this jewish orthodox family and it really wasn't gonna fly i mean it was way too much of a feminist to tolerate the women sitting behind the curtain crap and i was starting to realize maybe i was gay and maybe i didn't want to marry a nice jewish boy but (laughs) probably a girl from a third world country you know i had to sort of break out you know right all right. But all of that, I have to tell you, I love the term, you know, growing up in the Bronx, I, I, I find the, the term chutzpah to be an endearing term. But yet Absolutely. it's so relevant to what you're doing and how you're doing it, because, you know, this is not the day and age where, you know, the words coming out mean one thing. What that means is we're coming out to show the world who we are and how we are in service of bringing possibilities. And this is really what you're doing. You know, I love the book because, you know, many of us sit and we think, what what do we want to say in the world and how do we want to say it? But here we are, you know, the superhero, the raging skillet, 
I love that term. And I can't, I want to hear from your words, your mouth, the mouth of babes. What does that come to mean? You could have named this book anything, but I oh, have yeah. such an image of that. Well, you know, when I first started catering, I mean, like, again, this is the 80s, and I yeah. had a really 80s name to my business with Parties by Rossi. That was okay. the era of, like, Bodies by Jake, Parties by Rossi. Right. They would call me up, and they would say, can you make cucumber sandwiches on the Upper East Side? I was like, oh, kill me now. And <laughs> I was writing this food <laughs> column called The Raging Flying Skillet for a, a magazine that just was in the coffee culture. And I was just sending in my piece on deadline, and suddenly I went, the raging skillet. Boing, like a big light bulb over my head. Um, and almost immediately changed the name of my company, and almost immediately the kind of calls I would get were like, you can make a performance piece out of it. You know, hmm. would I feed 2,000 people food that looked like vaginas? Hell yes. Yeah. I am the vagina queen, you know. <laughs> would I feed 200 people from a bathtub? Why not? <laughs> So getting those kind of requests really helped the chutzpah thing. And the book really, at first I was kind of called The Devil and Mrs. Goldstein, which is kind of a cute name, but ultimately it just couldn't be anything but The Raging Skillet because that's who I am. Exactly. And, you know, we're going to take a short break when we come back. We're going to talk about how, what does the raging skillet mean for those of us that have probably lived in the state of bland or lived in the state of, dare I say it, you can't have this, you can't have that. And as my grandmother would be turning over in her grave now, watching some of the television chef shows where they say, don't put cheese on fish. We're going to take a short break, everyone, when we come back. We're going to talk with Chef Rossi. We're going to talk about the book. And we're going to bring some chutzpah from the skillet to the table. We'll be right back. Have a banana, Hannah. Try the salami, Tommy. Give with the gravy, Davy. Everybody eats when they come to my house. Try a tomato plate, too. Hi, I'm Tim Darter. And I'm Steve Kramer. Join us on Spirit Fire Radio. Discover how to add the mechanics of meditation to your day. And watch yourself connect in a whole new way. Find the amazing moments in life's routines that often pass us by. Add to your awareness with Spirit Fire Radio. Tune in each Wednesday at 9 a.m. for your weekly guide to practical mindfulness. And to learn more, visit www.spiritfireradio.com. Song of the Heart. Walking the Path of Light from author and healer Francine Vale is available now. Through Francine's life story, we learn how imperative it is to love one another. Once this simple truth is learned, peace on earth will prevail. Song of the Heart is a life lived and a story told for this purpose. To learn more about Francine and her amazing gifts, or to order your copy of the book today, visit angelsandlightbeings.com. Have you ever tried to make lifestyle changes but had difficulty following through? Imagine what it would be like to get up each morning with energy, clarity, and motivation to tackle the day. If you want to get past limiting barriers that are preventing you from living your best life, join holistic health and wellness coach T. Kerry Mitchell each month on The Dr. Pat Show. Or visit Lifestyle120.com today and start to receive the personal attention you deserve. Holistic Medical Center is where you find it all. A healthy space with doctors who care, see, and listen to the whole you. Hi, this is Dr. Darvish. If you have not found an answer to your chronic symptoms, you will find answers here at Holistic Medical Center. Our doctors find the root cause of your symptoms and guide your body towards healing naturally. We transform lives from within. Visit drdarvish.com or call 425-451-0404. A word of caution, if you prefer the status quo and you are not interested in improving every aspect of your life, this book will trigger the shift out of you. The Truth is Funny, Shift Happens is available now. Author Colette Steffen brings the powerful knowledge and life-changing energy and empowerment from the radio airwaves to the pages of her new book. To get your copy in paperback or e-book, visit thetruthisfunny.com today. 
Sky Siegel co-hosts one of today's most popular psychic shows, Angels and Answers, with Artie Hoffman as she communicates healing messages from the spirit world. These messages can be astounding, enlightening, and life-changing. Born with the God-given talent of inner guidance and the amazing ability to heal, Sky has healed thousands of people. Schedule a reading with Sky now. Call 908-500-1474 and visit skyofangels.com. Try a tomato plate too. Here's cacciatore, Dory. Taste the bologna, Tony. Everybody eats when they come to my house. Fixed- oh my gosh, taste the bologna, Tony. You're talking about my dad and my brother. That is exactly. Uh, uh, what are we saying? Uh, are the Tonys full of bologna? <laughs> I hope not. Oh boy. Be a oh fight, my brother. Be a fight on I'm hands. just saying. <laughs> Yeah, my brother is listening to this. I could hear my brother now. He's saying, you know what? I'm not a Tony. I'm an Anthony. Well, <laughs> I think we're splitting hairs. Uh, actually, I think we're splitting the Parmesan. So joining me here today, Chef Rossi, I'm telling you, uh, for those of you out there, the book is called, and, and I just want to make sure all of you know, um, not only is she an amazing chef, but she is the author of the book that I referred to in the first segment. For those of you that are just tuning in, The Raging Skillet. Here, you ready? The True Life Story of Chef Rossi by Rossi. But what does this book say? And, you know, Chef Rossi, we were talking about, you know, the dedication of the book. But we're also talking about the passion and the purpose that actually went in to writing this. Tell us a little bit about your personal journey and the journey and the evolution that the book has taken on now. Well, I always tell people, they're like, oh, why don't you just do it in a year or knock it off in two years? I'm like, no, it took me 16 years to do this. You know, I was like catering a wedding. I'd go home and write some notes and catering another wedding. I'd go home and take some notes. It had like 33 rewrites. And really, from beginning to end, it was about 16 years. So I'm like such an overnight sensation, right? I I kind of think I could not have written the book if I didn't have to write the book. It wasn't burning inside me was even making deals with God, you know, you can shorten my life, just let me walk into Barnes & Noble and buy my book, please. Of course, now I'm talking to God and saying, I take it back, I take it back. <laughs> um, but I, my mother, while she was alive, I remember I had published my first piece that I got paid for, and I was making fun of her for the microwave, and I mailed it to her, you know, this was pre-internet, and she called me, and I thought maybe she'd be mad at me because I was making fun of her. And she said, no, Slava, I'm thrilled. You're immortalizing me. Promise to always immortalize your mother. And so here I am immortalizing my mother. What can I say? Well, I mean, isn't that interesting that we do that? I mean, my grandma must be talking to me because I keep mentioning her, and then we're doing a show like this. But there is something there's something to be immortalized, and I wanted to ask you about that because that's the sense I get in the book. You know, there is an energy that's getting be, that's being passed to us. When I cook and I'm in the kitchen and I'm cooking and I'm doing my grandma's recipe – when I'm making her special meatballs, something happens to me, Chef Rossi. I get possessed, mm-hmm. right? Don't, don't you feel like this is part of this where you get to bring all of that forward to be mm-hmm. different, to mm-hmm. say, wait a minute. You know, this might be different and it might be new, but in some ways, isn't it kind of the old, in a sense, of the way we were brought up? Sure, we're going back to the old to make the new. Yeah. In the kitchen yesterday, I was with a very talented woman who works for me named Leslie. And I had her helping me recipe test something because I'm, like, putting together, of course, I'm putting together the second book. God forbid I was yeah. still for five seconds, you know. That's right. <laughs> but I have a recipe I want in that called a matzo lasagna or matzo lasagna a la Harriet, which my mother invented one year because we were kvetching her to death every Passover, you know, that we were missing pizza and pasta and lasagna. So she started layering a lasagna that she used to make with cottage cheese. She would layer it with matzo and then fill a marinara sauce with water and shake it and pour it over. And once it got nice and wet, she would stick it in the oven and out would come Passover lasagna. And uh, I would immediately stick it in the refrigerator and wait until the next day to eat it because I really like cold lasagna. And you know what? It was pretty damn good. Okay, maybe not as good as lasagna, but 
it was pretty close, and it got me through Passover. So I was in the kitchen testing it up yesterday, and of course I, you know, added a little bit of Rossi and a little less Harriet, but it was still my mama. You know, she was in the kitchen with us for sure. Yeah, here here's something that many people don't know. I was going through the book and I was looking at the recipe for uh, Rossi's teenage pizza bagels, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A- and I'm looking through the book, and here's the thing that I find that most people that are making pizzas, at least where I live, have forgotten: dried oregano. Mm-hmm. It is like how how do you even serve a pizza without oregano i don't really quite understand it and you know here's what's interesting is i'm th- i'm reading through this and i'm thinking oh my gosh i cannot wait to make this right mm-hmm. um i'm thinking to myself somewhere along the way people got basil and oregano confused don't you think mm-hmm. <laughs> oregano is like a dying art. I'm like, what happened to oregano? What happened? We have it in the kitchen. We put it in everything. We throw it in all our Mexican and Spanish food. It's fabulous. We throw it in our Italian food. And then also fresh oregano is another thing that gets lost. I throw that around like crazy, too. When I was growing it, up, my mother only had dry oregano, paprika, and garlic powder. That was it. That was her spice cupboard. And it would wind up in just about everything. But I have to say, I mean, if you have those three ingredients, dare I say, what else might you need? I mean, you're done. You're done. I mean, I went from and I think you'll appreciate this. I went from a just Italian, Italian, Italian family. My mom died. My dad remarries and he remarries a woman from the south, the deep south. Right. Oh, boy. Can you imagine what that table started to look like? It was some of the most incredible food and blend that sounds fabulous actually i, I mean chitlin's parmesan can mm-hmm. you even mm-hmm. i get it totally because we were raised kind of white trash meets jewish yeah so i was like <laughs> the only kid in my neighborhood who really could say i've had kishka and grits you know i mean how could i not become a caterer how could you not be a foodie with that kind of background it just has to be you know how did your story of survival how did your uh, you know, your growing up, your history, H- how did that help shape you? I was so fascinated by the similarities in, in our journey. And, mm-hmm. you know, I was homeless at 17. And boy, I'll tell you, I learned more in that arena that helped me in life than any school I ever went to. But how about you? How did that your well, story of survival help shape you? There's something about not having a parachute. That yeah. really makes you learn really fast. I mean, right. so I think we came to the no parachute school. Like I see kids in my neighborhood and they're moving into four or five and six thousand dollar apartments with their trust funds and they do not have a parachute, you know. So it's like I ran away from home and then my parents uh, sent me to live with the Fosses and that certainly didn't fit very well at all. Um, and ultimately I became a bartender. And I was one of those old school, by, you know, bartenders with the same 30 drunks. And the yeah. kitchen would close, and I'd be stuck with my drunks and Pepperidge Farm goldfish. Yeah. So I started going in the back and venting things for them to eat so they wouldn't throw up on my bar. And eventually I thought, you know, forget this dealing with the drunks crap. I'm just going to be a chef. Um, but this was the 80s, so even when I would get hired, they were, like, trying to make me quit. They didn't want the lawsuit, but they would do anything to make me quit. And I just kind of stuck with it because I had chutzpah. And I had a filthy mouth, um, and they appreciated both of that, both of them. And then eventually, when I started the Raging Skillet, that was the end of my onion chopping days, thank God. But uh, it was the beginning of my having real fun. Well, you know, this is really part of the, the conversation that has to do with the book. I mean, and has to do now with, I love that you're writing a second book. What mm-hmm. have you learned from writing this book, what did you learn from writing uh, The Raging Skillet? Well, it's interesting because I've been going back and rereading the book because so many people have read it and have told me that it should be a movie. So I yes, finally decided. I, agree. To, I mean, it has to be. So I finally yeah. decided to start writing my first screenplay. And so rewriting it, seeing it in my head as a movie, is kind of making me go back and relive it. And first of all, I'm like, holy crap, I really lived through some stuff. You know, it kind of has to be a movie. And people are always telling me, you made that up, you made that up. I'm like, uh-uh, just meet any surviving member of my family. 
you will not say that at all. Like I'm going to go to New Jersey on Thursday, and I'm going to be introduced by my old best friend from high school. And probably the first thing she's going to tell everyone is, no, she didn't make any of it up. You know, yeah. her mother really did get mistaken for a mailbox when she was standing on the corner in a blue house dress. So I think, you know, it's probably making me kinder, kinder to myself, you know, because I'm going back and saying, you know, in between the laughter, the, it really was rough and scary, and I can't even believe I survived. But um, probably making me love my mother a lot more than even I already did and being kinder and sweeter with my family in general. You know, making yeah. me a softer, softer girl. Yeah, yeah, and I love that you are. And we're going to let folks know where you're going to be in New Jersey as well. And, you know, part of this, too, is uh, I don't know that we can make some of this stuff up. You know, I shared a story once that, you know, I was sitting there and you know the routine in the Port Authority, in, um, uh, Port Authority and Grand Central, right? You know the routine. You're standing there, you know, and I'm going back a few years and you're standing there and you got your little cup and you got your little story like, hey, can you give me a quarter? I lost my wallet and I'm trying to get back to New Jersey. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, this is really part of a, of a journey you just can't make up. And no. yet and yet I think don't you find people are really open and want to hear stories like yours? Don't you find oh, that, yeah. though? People like to hear stories of surviving against all odds because. First of all, you know, they can kind of recognize when someone is full of poop, you know. Yeah. You have a sort of a privileged person who's never really suffered. You know, people kind of get that. And even if they are the privileged person who's never really suffered, you know, they may have a little guilt complex about that. So hearing a real story of someone who's really made it and really survived, people like that. You know, it's like you have your street cred, you know. I would put it Absolutely. Like that. They do. We're going to take a short break when we come back. What happens when you survive the heat of the summer in New York City? What do you decide you're going to cook? What do you decide you're going to create? For those of you out there, this book is really fabulous, and I agree completely. Not only, This can be a movie. This could be a Broadway play. Uh, it could be all of the above. And what, what do Chef Rossi and I have in common? What was it? about the day Elvis died. Let's take a short break, everyone. We'll be right back. to Sheer Alchemy with Leslie Fontaine on TransformationTalkRadio.com and get ready to stir up your passions, identify your blocks, and shift into an entirely new existence. Leslie Fontaine is a transformation catalyst and clairvoyant who uses her intuitive and energetic gifts to catapult listeners into living the life they were born to live. Whether it's shifting from scarcity to abundance, from emotional pain into joy, or from illness into health, Leslie will help you step into the true essence and power of all that you are with the help of the Ascended Masters and Archangels. You will not be the same. Visit TransformationTalkRadio.com for show dates and times and LeslieFontaine.com to say yes to explosive abundance. Are you ready for a radical shift in your way of being? Are you seeking a more deeply connected and fulfilling life? Awakened Living Radio is a show dedicated to helping you embrace a life filled with profound peace, connection, and happiness. TJ Woodward is passionate about helping you find your clarity, balance, and purpose. Join co-host TJ Woodward and Dr. Pat Basile on the first Monday of every month at 11 a.m. Pacific time for Awakened Living Radio on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Join the Pacific Northwest EFT Tappers at the 6th Annual Tappers Gathering March 19th at Bastyr University in Seattle. You will learn EFT applications, forge a strong community, and share healing stories. The event raises money and awareness for EFT tapping scientific research. Net proceeds go to our 501c3 nonprofit to further prove the efficacy of EFT. 
Bring your cards and information for a fun and inspiring day of networking. Visit nwtappersgathering.com or call 360-661-6877. Are you ready to stop stress, anxiety, and low self-esteem from running your life? Join award-winning author Dr. Friedemann Schaub for Empowerment Radio and learn breakthrough solutions to switch out of survival mode and approach every day with great ease, joy, and purpose. Tune in the first and third Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific to Empowerment Radio with host Dr. Friedemann Schaub on Transformation Talk Radio. Visit the fear and anxiety solution.com to learn more. Get into it for 2016. Do you want more prosperity, clarity, energy, and balance in your life? Join Lynn Brown now through March for one of her amazing workshops, each focusing on a key part of living your best life. For more information and to register for one of these amazing workshops, visit lynnbrownevent.com. That's lynnbrownevent.com. And get into it this 2016 with Lynn Brown. Oh, my goodness. Benny, thank you, thank you, thank you. For those of you that are just tuning in, but uh, also for many of you out there that are asking me about today's show and about the book, let me just give you lots of information. I'm thrilled to have Chef Rossi joining me here today. As I said, New York City's wildest and most beloved anti-caterer, and you're finding out why here today. Um, Also, you can uh, find out more by going to theragingskillet.com. You can see a copy, get a copy of her book. Uh, And for those of you that are wondering, okay, where is Chef Rossi going to be? As we've mentioned before, um, you know, on the 10th, uh, she's going to be in River Road Book in Fairhaven, uh, River Road Book, Fairhaven, New Jersey. And then in April, you're going to L.A., is that right? Right. April 26th, I'll be at Book Soup on the Sunset Strip. Nice. really fun. Be like Passover on the Sunset Strip. (laughs) <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, you know, there had to be a part of the book that minimally had to talk about Elvis in some way, in some mm-hmm. way. If you and I are growing up in the city and there's an attachment to Elvis at all, how could you even begin or not begin to talk about this? But you call it the day Elvis died. I would love for you to share this story with our listeners. Oh, yeah. Well, we were always driving back and forth to Florida. My father got some Pacaca bungalows in Panama City when nobody went to Panama City. This is way before spring break. And so he was a teacher, so he would have the summer off. And the only thing worse than Panama City is Panama City in the summer. So we'd be driving from Jersey to Florida and Jersey to Florida all the time to these bungalows. And one day we're in this fat lady's clothing store in Georgia, and my mother was torturing us by pulling out these horrifying polyester fat lady outfits. And my sister, who was not fat, was hiding under the, the uh, racks reading these magazines. This woman would kind of come on the loudspeaker and be like, ladies, this sale on aisle two. And all the fat ladies would run over to wherever she said to go. So the woman comes on the loudspeaker and she goes, ladies, Lord, help us. Elvis is dead. He's dead. And all the fat ladies just started crying and pandemonium and clothes was flying. And I was just like, oh, my God, what happened? My mother went in the back in the shoe section, and she just kind of sat there and watched all these ladies carry on. And she finally started to cry, and she kept crying. Like, the other ladies just stopped crying, like, way long ago. And I went back there, and I held her hand, and I was like, Mommy. No, I had no idea you liked Elvis so much. And she looks at me like kind of perplexed, and she goes, why? Did something happen to Elvis? And it was just like, there I was the day Elvis died, having this very bizarre experience with my mother in Georgia. You just can't make it up, you know? No, you can't. And then then you write about, and in the book, you, you, you talk about 
eggs I'd cook for Elvis. Mm -hmm. Of course you would. And I love, I love, and, and anybody that knows anything about Elvis, you better have two heaping plops of sweet butter in it for sure. Mm -hmm. well, we for sure. We a sandwich in his honor all the time, mm -hmm. which is the Elvis sandwich, which traditionally has banana in it, but the banana wouldn't hold over too well for catering. But we right. do a peanut butter and crispy bacon sandwich that we cut into little triangles, and we love to pass it like as if we're passing beluga caviar, like as if it's the most expensive thing imaginable. And out we come with the little Elvis sandwiches, and people go nuts for it. It like, kind of even gives a uh, shrimp competition. Yeah. I, you know, I, I want to ask you, if you look back now at, you know, and for those of you out there, the book is fabulous. It takes you on a journey. And as you're going on this journey and you relate to this, right, because I am so going to be on that egg uh, recipe. But as you relate to this, you start to look at some of the ingredients that have gone in to, to some of the food here and some of the things you've created. And I wanted to just ask you, what has been, if you, if you could think about, you know, a couple of aha moments that you've had along the way to being Chef Rossi, what would be your top three? Well, I think being in the restaurant business probably prepared me because that was a terrible combination of high stress and boredom. So we're doing the same menu day after day after day, and we're like, oh, time to make the swordfish. Remember that Dunkin' Donuts <laughs> commercial? Time yeah. to make the donuts. And even if we're feeding a 1,000 people a day, we're doing the same thing over and over again. So I was just sort of living for the salad special or the pasta special or something remotely different. So what I did when I started my catering business, when I, I decided right then and there to have every menu we ever do written to order. So that way, every time I come to work, it's a different menu, and everyone's excited and Granted, you know, they go on my website and they fall in love with things that we're kind of famous for. But for the most part, it's a new menu every time, and no one ever gets stagnant and no one ever gets bored. And the word is out to whatever your guilty pleasure is, like this is a place to call. And whatever your multi-ethnic thing is, this is a place to call. So a Jewish bride and Jamaican groom, they can come over here and have jerk chicken on latkes. Why not? You know, yeah. Rules are kind of like a fabulous thing to break. That was probably my biggest aha moment was to look at rules as just something to break, you know, and not be imprisoned by them. And, you know, part of this, too, is now, you know, we are completely infatuated, aren't we, right now in this country with, you know, the, the food anything. You know, what do we have, two or three major food networks out in the world? And the people that are showing up at these food networks, they're not traditional. They're not like you think, you know, Francois in the kitchen, you know, knocking out some French recipe, you know, they're the hamburger and sandwich guy, or, you know, they're people that we're looking at and saying, you're more like me. Do you have a sense of that? Because when I read the book the first time and I'm going through it and, you know, and looking at the recipes, I thought, man, you know, like I found my sister here. Are people mm, saying that? Well, I yeah. think people are really ready for that. Look, yeah. that show Diners, Drive-Ins and Dives. I love yeah. that show. People get such yeah. a kick out of that show because he's just traveling around going to dumps, and we all yeah. love that, dumps with love, you know, with someone's mother kind of love. And people know that when they come into the kitchen, they're not just going to see boring old French chefs, no offense, no offense to the French, you know, yeah. in these white jackets and big hats, you know. I mean, in some restaurants maybe, yes, but for the most part, they're just going to see some fun person in there trying to make a difference. And people are, you know trying to just break out and trying to be independent and, and generally being rewarded if they are. So it's not like you can really invent the stone. I mean, very rarely do you do something that's just never, ever, ever been done before. But if you just follow your passion and don't be so afraid of the rules, you know, I think you're going to be just fine. You know, there's a line from here in your book and I, I wanted to talk with you about it because it so represents, I think, what we're seeing. People really coming to the forefront and saying, you know what, I'm just going to be me. And I think it was, I, and I wrote it down, so I apologize in advance if I'm not going to get this right. But I think you said something like, you know, you can leave Kingston Avenue, right? The kosher dairy, you know, shopkeeper said to you, I think, but it's always on you. 
the road sticks under your feet. And I looked at that and I, I just cried. There was a part of me that that hit that just cried. How important is it for us and, and especially, you know, in the field you're in to really remember our roots and remember the things that truly have shaped us? I think it's everything. I mean, that mm-hmm. conversation really did happen. When I yeah. was getting ready to leave that neighborhood, the shopkeeper yep. did say that to me, and I mm-hmm. never forgot it. I think mm-hmm. it comes back to me every now and then because no matter how wild I get or how wild I don't get, I mean, in the end, you know, I'm a nice Jewish girl from New Jersey, whatever. <laughs> you know, maybe I used to hide it, you know. <laughs> when I first right. came to New York, I never wanted anyone to know where I was from, and I never wanted people to know that I was really nice, you know. Oh, now I don't care. It's that, like, you know, turning 50 thing, you know, the one that Sykes, Sykes talks about, you know, women over 50 don't give a boop, you know. Yeah. me. I don't care. Yep. So what? I like Barbara Streisand. I'm Jewish. I was born in New Jersey. So what? So what? Sue me. Whatever. I like it. Me. Uh, and, you know, for those of you out here, there is something that I think many of you, uh, at least listening to the show, you've heard me talk about entomans and this is what i want to say we're going to take a a quick break when we come back what is it about entomans that has stayed in the cells of our body what is it that when for example when when you come to seattle you've got to eat the salmon you've got to eat the crab when you go to new york what are you going to eat you're going to eat the hot dog from the street, and you're going to look for Entenmann's blackout cake. Let's take a short break. When we come back, how does Entenmann's become a sound bite for just yummy? Stay tuned. We'll be right back. What if your body and mind were the compasses to the secrets, mysteries, and magic of life? Glenna Rice, co-host of The Questionable Parent, is inviting you to access all that is possible. Glenna is a 10-year certified veteran access consciousness facilitator who offers an amazing variety of life-changing classes and workshops. Work with Glenna from anywhere with teleclasses and workshops all over the globe. To learn more and see Glenna's current schedule of events, classes, and workshops, visit GlennaRice.com. Awaken to your radiant, authentic self. For over 15 years, Soul Purpose Advocate Nancy Monson has been focused on leading change in the lives of those looking to live their true purpose. She is devoted to supporting people and living a soul-directed life every day. Let Nancy help you overcome fear, worry, and doubt. Visit EverydaySpirituality.com to learn how Nancy can be your Soul Purpose Advocate. What are vibes? We often use this word, but did you know vibes can actually be useful and help solve our everyday challenges? Embark on an exciting learning journey with Caitlin Keat, 11-time Visionary Award winner, specialist in vibrational energy, and the creator of Vibes Up. Join Caitlin as she takes you through the world of vibrational therapy and energy healing with natural solutions for a modern world. Visit VibesUp.com to learn more today. What if we really didn't have to die to go to heaven? Are you curious about the afterlife or rebirth? The highly anticipated new book from author Dr. Susan Allison, You Don't Have to Die to Go to Heaven, is available now. Find out how to find guidance and healing in the spirit realms. Order the book today and put it on your must-read list for 2016. Visit DrSusanAllison.com to learn more. Can you keep your lifestyle in retirement? It's a question people often wonder about. Ask Ameriprise Financial Advisor Jeff Packman about the new Confident Retirement Approach. You and Jeff can break down retirement planning step-by-step to get the real answers you need. Call Jeff Packman Financial Advisor today at 425-453-0272. Offices located at 601-108th Avenue Northeast, Suite 1800, Bellevue, Washington, 98004. 
The Confident Retirement Approach is not a guarantee of future financial results. Investment and advisory products and services are made available through Ameriprise Financial Services Incorporated, a registered investment advisor. Ameriprise Financial Services Incorporated, member of FINRA and SIPC. Almost everyone at some time in their lives ask themselves, what am I? Most of our questions are ego-generated and simply don't address the problem of our false self. It's time to relax your ego and embody your soul. Dr. Dan Cohen, neurologist, inventor, and author, has created tools to awaken a new way to transform from who you thought you were into what you truly are. Visit toolstoawaken.com today. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. It's great to have you here. I want to just make sure that you all know that you can go to the website, theragingskillet.com. And when you get there, uh, everything we're talking about, you're pretty much going to find here, um, including a way for you to click on menu items, click on recipes, get a copy of the book. uh, And for those of you that are thinking, well, what is the book? What is she talking about? Just want you to know is that this really could be a movie or a Broadway hit. It's called, you know, the book is called The Raging Skillet, The True Life Story of Chef Rossi. Not only are the recipes bringing me back to a space and time that is so relevant today, but also the journey. You know, what we love to talk about is the journey. How do we get to the place where we are? And then when we get there, how do we appreciate where we've come from? And that's what Chef Rossi is sharing with us. You know, she's taking us on a journey of how life creates itself and how each and every one of us gets to show up so that we can be exactly who we were meant to be. Chef Rossi, thank you for today. It is so great to have you. You're Um, welcome. You're so charming. I have to tell you this pudding recipe you got in here. And I was Mm -hmm. telling you that it struck a chord with me. I love Entenmann's blackout cake which they no longer make. And I saw that recipe. Research for you. Oh, uh, tell us about the idea of putting pudding in cake because it's foreign to a lot of people, well, but not know, to us. I love that. I, yeah. love, well, I love doing things with pudding anyway because it, yeah. I feel like, you know, what happened to pudding? We used to eat it all the time. It's like disappeared. <laughs> we just did a wedding that we took chocolate cups and filled it with banana pudding and sautéed bananas and topped it with whipped cream. We're calling it banana bombs. It was like huh? amazing seller. People were like, whoa, no bread? I'm, I'm down for it. Yeah. The Entenmann's was that we had all this leftover Entenmann's cake because my mother would come on these Jewish field trips where she would yep. drop off Hebrew National hot dogs and Entenmann's cake. And there That's was right. usually something wrong with the Entenmann's cake. It was like <laughs> more than a day old or out of the freezer or squashed. You know, some reason she got it on special. And so it was sort of embarrassing to serve it as is. So I started cutting it into pieces and then putting banana pudding or vanilla pudding on top and covering that with fruit and chocolate chips and things like that. And I would kind of make a gourmet dessert out of it, at least gourmet for me at that point in my life. People were like, whoa, you know. But the truth of the matter is if I served it right now, people would still be like, whoa, you know, banana pudding or vanilla pudding on an intimate cake is pretty whoa. I, you know. Now I might make the pound cake, maybe not, maybe yes, I don't know. But uh, also Entenmann's is, makes a great French toast worth trying at home, definitely. Yeah, and here's the thing that I want to share about this, right? Because this is something that we're not, we're not talking about. You know, the, what I'm really struck by is how robust the recipes are. So when I'm talking about Entenmann's blackout cake and you guys go Google it, there, I will tell you that don't pay attention to any of the pictures in that you see where the chocolate looks like milk chocolate. No, Entenmann's blackout cake has minimally two layers of this pudding filling and a layer on the top. And it's, we are talking thick. We're talking something so thick, uh, Chef Rossi, that some of the cakes, it's really hard to get them all looking level because Mm -hmm. they're either flopping from one side to the other because they're so decadent. And yeah, I just want to say to everybody, Chef Frost is going to look into it because, yes, contrary to what you might think, the blackout cake has been 
discontinued. But maybe oh. we can have a comeback on this. What do you think, Chef Rossi? Yeah, look, they brought Twinkies back, right? Yeah. People weren't having it. When t- Twinkies was going under, they were like, hell no, we won't go. So why not? But I'm going to look yeah. into it for you. We like a good challenge. You know? We like a good challenge. And, you know, it's really important because, you know, this is something that I, I wanted to, you know, to for you to talk about. You know, there's a level of, I, I use the word robust in food that I grew up with. And that doesn't mean, I just want to be clear, that doesn't mean the plate is piled 50 gallons high with food. But there's a level of juiciness to food that I think you grew up with and I grew up with. So when I look at the pictures of the cake, I say to my friends, no, it is not a milk, it's not milk chocolate. Mm -hmm. I'll send you the picture. And there's just a level of robustness to food. Is that really what you're finding now? People are wanting to have that level of deliciousness again. Well, I mean, it depends on where you go and where you eat. But I Mm -hmm. personally would never go anywhere that didn't have it. And I personally Mm -hmm. would not cook in any way that didn't have it. You know, like every once in a while, someone calls me up and they'll say something like, I want clean food, nothing marinated, no sauces, everything a perfect dime size bite. And I'll say, you know, maybe you should call somebody else. I'm not a clean lady, you know. (laughs) Even if I go on cooking shows, I would be like, listen, you just have to understand I'm going to make a mess. You know, because in the kitchen I have a wonderful woman that follows me around and things are flying all over the place, you know. But I cook with a lot of passion. Um, I like flavors that really bang in your mouth. That doesn't mean that they have to be too spicy of anything. I don't want something that's so spicy that you can't taste it. You know, sometimes things are so high in the heat that you can't taste anything else going on. I want you to have a full experience, so I won't cross the line with spice. If they want me to cross the line with spice, I'll do it, but I prefer to do the spicy sauce on the side because I want my food to really sing, and then they can try it, you know. If I do a beef, I want it to marinate for two or three days, and I want the outside to be crusted and the inside just to... You know, it has this whole process. It's like bringing up a small child. Yeah. You know, I wanted to say to everybody here that are, that you're sending me messages about the black eyed cake when now, you know, Chef Rossi's going to dig into it. You're absolutely right, Chef Rossi. One of the people that is messaging us right now said, is it the Brooklyn blackout cake? It is because guess what? Entenmann's, right? Mm-hmm. And so, yes, if you see that picture of Lost Foods of New York City, Brooklyn blackout cake, that article it, it is that moist. That is what we're talking about. That is what exactly uh, faded out in the 80s. Um, Chef Rossi, thank you for today. I wanted to, I know we've talked about a lot of things, but I wanted to save a couple of minutes here, you know, to ask you, what do you want to share with us? What is the message behind the method, so to speak, behind being that person that, you know, is inviting us to join the wacky with you? Well, I think it really just comes down to love. You know, food really is love. If it's not love, there's something terribly wrong. And, you know, whatever you do, if you're not a chef and you're a janitor, you know, whatever it is, you know, just have some love in your life. It really does show. People really can tell. I mean, I've given money to women at toll booths on I-95 who had enormous love for their job. They told me hello and goodbye, and I was like, how does she do that smiling? It's got to be the worst job in the world. But I left feeling enchanted. So when people eat something, I really do think they walk away knowing if there was a little bit of love happening. And also, they can walk away knowing if there was a little bit of sex happening. So it's not so bad to be turned on also while you're cooking. Okay, yeah, then. no kidding. No kidding. Wow. Thank you for today. And, you know, I love this. The best job I had, except for the one I have now, was selling hot dogs from a hot dog cart. Mm-hmm. I loved it. I used my my grandma's Italian onion recipe. I knew everybody's name, and I would never serve people a gray hot dog. So thank you for including hot dogs in your book. Thanks, Chef Rossi. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Awesome. Hey, everybody, like I said before, The Raging Skillet, you can find out lots about Chef Rossi. And again, uh, if you want to catch her in New Jersey, we've got a post up on our website at the Dr. Pat Show. Um, And don't forget to get a copy of the book. I mean, it is an amazing, 
an amazing journey that you'll take to find out what life could be and how you say yes, how you say yes to showing up as you. And boy, I'm telling you, try the swordfish. We're going to take a short break, everybody. We'll be right back. The preceding audio was via a Skype call. 